thank you, Toya, for uh, pulling all these great people together. This is a great opportunity. Uh, let me start by saying that um, uh, I'm an investment banker and entrepreneur by training, so I didn't have any background in Africa or with developing countries or poor people. So um, when I got to be about 50 years old, I started looking for something other interesting to do, and I quit the investment banking world and the private equity world and followed an Anglican bishop to Rwanda uh, along with Scott, and uh, through there we met President Kagame. Um, about 10 years ago, 2007, 2008, President Kagame invited Scott and I to join a group of other international friends uh, in an advisory council called the Presidential Advisory Council of Rwanda, and we were committed to meet with the president and his senior ministers twice a year for several years. And each time we would meet, we would get a download from the, the government leaders about what they're dealing with. How do you build a nation? What are the challenges? And in those very first sessions, we learned that the Rwandans are way out ahead of us in terms of having a vision of what they want to do and a blueprint on how to do it. And they explained to us that the best examples that they had found in the globe of poor countries who had lifted themselves up to highly prosperous economies were the Asian tigers the uh, South Korea's, Taiwan's, Hong Kong's, and Singapore. And particularly Singapore was attractive to the Rwandans because of its size and its role that it had played in really accelerating progress in the emerging economy. And so they told us that they'd learned that there are some basic pillars of building a country that they, they uh, things like security, healthcare, education, infrastructure, rule of law, and ultimately that creates an environment where you can have a vibrant private sector. And basically they said, we got this. We're, we're on it, we're putting all those pillars together. But what we noticed about the Asians that really accelerated their economies was two actions they took where an international friend can be particularly helpful. So here are the two things. In order to really accelerate your economy and grow industry, you have got to aggressively recruit foreign investors to come into your country and build first-class businesses so that we can see it, so we can understand it, so we can be connected to networks. That foreign investor, so if the first challenge they had for us was, will you build a business here, and will you encourage all your friends to come to Rwanda and build foreign-owned businesses. The second piece that goes along with that, the other side of the coin, which is equally critical, is to take the most promising young people that you have in your country and give them the opportunity to study abroad, and then most important, get them back to become the leaders and the entrepreneurs of those industries that you're trying to create. And they used to laugh and say, the Singaporeans told us that when they started doing this back in the 60s and the 70s, 10 years later, all those foreign-owned businesses were managed by Singaporeans. And 10 years after that, because of their entrepreneurship and their success, all of those industries were primarily owned by Singaporeans. And they said, that's our game plan. And the role you can play is build businesses, encourage other foreigners to build businesses, and create the opportunities for our best and brightest to study abroad and then get back here and launch their careers. So in 2007, we created a U.S. nonprofit called Bridge to Rwanda with the idea of doing those two things. Um, you know, we didn't have any particular mission. We didn't have a particular business. What we approached this challenge with is that, one, I can sell Rwanda. You know, I believe in it. I love it. This is what my life's about. I'm a sale. I can sell and market Rwanda and drag people onto this bridge. I can connect them. I can encourage them. And I can facilitate them doing something productive when they get there. So Bridge to Rwanda was really about being a bridge a facilitator, connector, 
marketer, cheerleader, encourager to get other people to get on that bridge and come over. Um, the philosophy that we adopted is that the work, the fruit of our work would grow on other people's trees. That's our philosophy. Um, the first business we focused on, I, I had a lot of the, uh, the president and this bishop telling me, you need to build businesses here, and I'm scratching my brain, what business could I build as an investment banker that would have any impact? And I learned about microfinance. So the very first business that I got involved with was bringing a microfinance bank to Rwanda called Opportunity International, which is a, one of the largest, oldest, faith-motivated microfinance organizations. And over the course of two or three years, we were able to convince this organization to start there, to come there. We helped raise five or six million dollars of capital. We were actually able to recruit a commercial banker and a CFO from Little Rock, Arkansas to move their families to Rwanda and start this bank from scratch. We were able to merge it into one of the other large microfinance banks. And within about three or four years, we had this bank called Owego Opportunity Bank. And we basically served on the board and encouraged it. Today, Owego is the largest microfinance bank in the country. It serves 400,000 poor people. The average loan is $300 the average savings account has $70 in it. That was our first engagement. But in order to build the kind of economy Rwanda wants, you have to go bigger. And that's why guys like Scott Ford and Donnie, getting that kind of entrepreneurial talent to engage in Rwanda and to bring their skills and their network and their passion to build these businesses is how a Rwanda is going to accelerate its economy. Um, one of the things we learned, though, is in the early days, in order for an American investor to invest in this company and actually get it off the ground, they had to have young, hardworking, talented boots on the ground that would start that business and they could work with to get the business running. In the early years, all those young boots on the grounds were young Americans who, who, for the adventure of it, would come over to Rwanda and help start businesses and work in churches and work in the government and work in hospitals and stuff like that. That kid, Matt Smith, that helped Scott was actually my business manager. And the first thing, the week of the closing, Scott called me and said, you know I have to hire him in order to do this deal. Well, over the last seven years now, I think 10 years, I think Scott's hired six Bridge to Rwanda business guys to work at West Rock Coffee. I'm mostly sorry. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. Now he's hiring Rwanda presidential, I mean Rwanda B2R scholars, teaching them the coffee business. The president came to us in 2010 and said, look, they had started a program to send Rwandan students to the U.S., and they were willing to pay for everything except tuition. So we were able to get 20 different colleges here in the South to give free tuition. It's the reason we have had probably 90 to 100 Rwandan students in the state of Arkansas going to college since about 2007. But he came to us in 2010, <laughs> and he said, we need a better, we need a program that doesn't cost us so much money. And he said, can you come up with a program where our students would actually earn a full ride? And I know that the issue is English. They've got to be able to take an SAT test and a TOEFL test and go through the application process and the interview process. And we've got brilliant math and science students, but their English is always going to be an issue. So he, said, he asked us to start something. So we started the B2R Scholars Program in 2011. We went out and partnered with Kaplan, which is the top test prep organization. We became the first certified Kaplan Center in Africa. And um, we started recruiting students in 2011. Uh, we told them that we can't guarantee you anything, but you're going to have to take a whole year off after high school. And we'll bring in teachers and college counselors, and we'll see if we can get you a scholarship. 
this fall, this spring, in March, we started our eighth cohort. This is our eighth year. In the first seven years, we have been able to help 210 students earn $50 million of scholarships in 70 universities around the world. Uh, you know, you have to go where the money is, and the people who have the money for scholarships are big, rich, private colleges that me or my family could have never got in. But we have almost 50 students who are in Ivy League schools. We've got four to eight students in every one of the Ivy Leagues. MIT, Chicago, Northwestern, Stanford, Vanderbilt, Notre Dame, Georgetown. We have four students who went to the military academies, West Point's Air Force Academy and Coast Guard. Um, they have made us all really proud. They, they did a lot better than we ever, ever could have imagined. But the most important thing about this whole program is how many of these students come back and how do they launch their careers. Now, we make them sign an agreement. When they enter the program, they sign that they will come back within 90 days when they get their undergraduate degree. No PT, no graduate school, you come back and work in Africa for three years. When you're an adult and you can sustain yourself in Africa, then you can choose to live and go and do wherever you want to go. But that's our deal. Now, despite that, this is a very enticing country. And we have had our first three classes graduate. We have almost 30. Now, I have a 210 students that have gone off. We've only had 30 graduate, but we have 15 that are already back. More than half, which is better than any other international program I know. And I'm still counting on at least another half of the other ones to come back within the next year or two. The impact is getting those students back and engaged in the economy across all sectors. And what difference will they make? Now, the reasons that students don't come back, what we've learned about international students, is the first time is that if they come over here and they stay over here for three or four years and they're between the ages of 18 or 19 and early 20s, they're incredibly impressionable. They have not a lot of life experience. And if they don't go back home on a regular basis, they forget about home. They lose contact with their family and their friends and their country and their people. And they start to think they're Americans. And they care a lot more about America than they do about their own country. So we make it a requirement that our students go home every summer. They don't stay in America more than nine or ten months. We sing them back, and we get them internships. So the last three years, we've organized 100 to 120 summer internships in Rwanda with the best employers. The second reason that young people, international students, don't go home is because they don't think they can find a job that's going to allow them to continue developing in their career. We, we now have a career development team. The career development team is all B2R scholars who've already graduated and come back. And I've worked with them for the last three or four years, and we now have a network of the top 60 or 70 employers in the country of Rwanda who will employ these students as summer interns and ultimately as full-time permanent jobs, okay? So we have them in the banking sector, in the business sector, in the ag sector, in healthcare, in the government, in education. So the key is that, uh, is that we have to have a relationship with those employers and we have to remind them all the time that this young person is coming back you don't have to treat them any different than any other college graduate who comes out of the University of Rwanda to start with. But I will guarantee you that within two to three years that these young people who have had this opportunity to study abroad and have got this global perspective, they will carry a bigger responsibility on their shoulders and will be worth more money to you than you can imagine. So we are in the early stages of doing this. We are uh, also, just by the way, four years ago, we started taking students, the very smartest students we could find, from Burundi, from the DRC, and from South Sudan. Part of that reason is those are all conflict zones. 
And it's important that our Rwandan students remember where they came from. And that it's also important to plant a seed in the minds of brilliant young South Sudanese and Congolese of what's possible. And, uh, and the truth is, the universities, universities that want international African students pride themselves in having students from everywhere. Well, they didn't used to have Rwandan students, and now they've got a lot of Rwandan students. But they can never find Congolese, South Sudanese, or Burundians. So they're the easiest students we have to place in these full scholarships. Bridge Rwanda is at a tipping point. Our tipping point is driven by two or three things. The first one, the most important one, is that we have a class graduating. We have 23 students graduating this month and in June from American colleges. And it looks like 15 of them will be coming back to Rwanda between now and the end of the summer. That will give us 30 B2R scholars who've gone through the whole program, got their degrees, and come back. In a little country like Rwanda, 30 young people placed in all of the right employers, in the government, in the private sector, in the NGO community, they make a difference. Our goal is to create a fellowship of servant leaders who care about each other and care about their countries. So it is the fellowship, the relationship of these young people to have each other's back for the rest of their lives that creates transformational power in the hands of God. That's our mission. So it doesn't really matter if B2R is around. It doesn't really matter if the businesses stick around. What matters is, do these 200-plus young people get back to this continent, and they love each other, they share the vision, they share the spirit, and they commit their lives to improving the lives of the people in their countries? That's the mission. The second tipping point is the fact that starting this year, we have a staff of teachers, counselors, career advisors, business development people that we have about 20, or 18 or 19. This year, all but seven of them will be Bridge to Rwanda scholars and Rwandans. So relatively quickly, the experience, they've been through this experience, they're the best ones to, to, to get the, the students behind them to come back. But more important, it's owned by Rwandans. The whole program, the whole idea is owned by our students who've been through this deal. And so moving, getting enough students back so that we can staff our own organization with the Rwandans is the second major tipping point. The third major tipping point is the fact that now that we have 200 students in the pipeline, it's not very impressive that we just keep getting more scholarships to Ivy League schools. What matters is how many of those 200 students come back to Africa and launch careers and have an impact. So our focus, we're going to cap the number of students that we do every year. We've done as many as 40. We're going to cap it at somewhere below 30. And part of our goal is people ask us all the time, when are we going to start a bridge to Rwanda or a bridge to so-and-so? We aren't. But we're gonna, we are going to invite a whole network of organizations we know about around Africa who are trying to do the same thing, to come and study what we do and to be a facilitator of a starting Bridge to Rwanda type of programs around the continent. On the, the thing we are going to focus on is business development and career development, is that it's all about how do you get young Africans who've had the opportunity to study around the world and develop skills and develop a global perspective. How do you get them back? Well, the way you get them back, you create businesses they're excited about being part of. You help them be entrepreneurs. You help them contribute to their country. The, the advantage that we have in Rwanda is that this is a country that has had a purpose and its leaders have a purpose. There's a narrative, I'll end with this, there's a narrative in Rwanda that says the country's only about three decades, two and a half, 25 years old since the genocide. In the 90s, the key player, it was a period of horrible violence, 
terror. The player, the important player in Rwanda in the 90s was the soldier, the person who gave up their career wherever it was and put on a uniform, picked up a gun, and fought the fight to bring security and freedom to Rwanda. In the period from 2000 to 2010 was the period of building a country from scratch. And many of those people who were soldiers and many others came back and they became public servants. They became mayors and commissioners and oftentimes they got paid uh, with a bag of grain and a bottle of oil. And they built Rwanda from absolutely nothing to what is becoming one of the potentially fastest developing countries in the world. But there is a third chapter that begins on this story after the public servant and the soldier, is that for Rwanda to become Singapore, the private sector has got to explode. And the player of the private sector is the entrepreneur. And the people who were the players in the 90s and the 2000s are too old to be the entrepreneurs. And our scholars and their generation are the entrepreneurs that will really make Rwanda the Singapore of Africa. Thank you. The distance between today's promising Rwanda and tomorrow's prosperous Rwanda isn't nearly as far as you think. To reach it, we only need a bridge and people who are led to cross it. Committed friends from the US and other developed countries who feel called to be part of Rwanda's rising and the Rwandans themselves, humble, strong, and determined to make their country a light to all of Africa. Our bridge is built on four pillars, grounded in divine guidance, education, entrepreneurship, and servant leadership. First, we find the most talented and promising young leaders in all of Rwanda. These are young people who truly wish to make a difference for their country. Next, we prepare our young leaders spiritually and academically so that they're ready to meet the incredible challenges that lie ahead of them on the bridge. Then, through the generosity of colleges, universities, and donors like you, we connect these talented young people with scholarships and host families in the U.S. Here they get degrees, learn from the success of others, and prepare themselves to return to Rwanda to fill critical jobs in the new Rwanda economy. A 21st century economy where our young leaders help create solutions, businesses, and infrastructure, passable roads, enabling technology, schools, farms and factories, businesses big and small, the economy grows. Lives transform, the bridge grows stronger, and Rwanda fulfills its promise to become a leader among nations.